I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 14. I'm going to read verse 14 in a moment, but let me just remind you of the context very briefly. Paul is writing this in prison, and in verse 10 to verse 18, he talks about the warfare in which a Christian is engaged. And one of the things he says in verse 12 is our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We might have expected Paul to say that our struggle was against flesh and blood, considering the fact that he's in prison, he is subject to a corrupt judicial system, he's already been in prison for two years in Caesarea because he would not pay a bribe, he's appealed to a higher court, he is sent to Rome, he has been in Rome for two years at the end of the book of Acts and still not made a court appearance. And... Uh, you would think that Paul would say, you know, one of our enemies is flesh and blood. It is the corruptness of human beings. He writes elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the five times I received from the Jews, the 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, I've been in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from false brothers. So he might say, well, at least there's some flesh and blood you've got to watch out for because they are fighting against you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. But Paul was smart enough to see beyond that. And what he says in verse 12 is our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And the enemy forces are spiritual, though they may work through flesh and blood. Don't confuse flesh and blood as being the enemy. It isn't. The enemy are the principalities and powers that operate, the rulers of this dark world. Now, I've called this series, and looking at these verses, disarming the darkness, there are two things we need to know. We need to know our power. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And that power is sufficient. Be strong in the Lord. And secondly, we need to know our armor. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And he lists six pieces of armor that a Roman soldier would use. And he likens them to a part of the Christian message and how that we are to wear this armor. Verse 14, let me read it to you. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We talked about that last time. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And I want to talk about that this morning. The piece of armor he calls the breastplate of righteousness. I guess in modern idiom, it would be the bulletproof vest of righteousness because a breastplate protected the vital organs, the organs that keep you alive. You can live without a leg, but you don't live with a heart that's not functioning and lungs that have been damaged. And so it's the breastplate of righteousness that protects your breast, the bulletproof vest of righteousness. Now, this word righteousness is probably a scary word for most of us for one of two reasons. Either because it sounds impossibly demanding. Whatever righteousness is, it is way up there somewhere. And although I'm a Christian, you expect me to be righteous, we might say, no, don't ever use that word about me because I might aspire to it but it seems impossibly demanding for me. Or, on the other hand, this word righteous smacks of self-righteousness, which is something we hate with all its connotations of judgmentalism and looking down our long noses at other people and criticizing them. But the word righteous is a frequent word in Paul's vocabulary, especially in the New Testament. And it's defined in two ways. It's defined, first of all, in relationship to God, in that God is righteous. There are statements like 2 Corinthians 5.21, when Paul speaks of the righteousness of God. 
In Romans 3, he speaks of God's righteousness. Romans chapter 1, a righteousness from God. Now there he's referring to God's moral character, that is to who God is and how God behaves. And he says the word that defines God's moral character is that he is righteous. Now that's the first and the most important way in which this word is used in the New Testament. Secondly, though, it is also used in relationship to people. It's used to describe people, but to describe people in a very particular way. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, he speaks of those who receive God's gift of righteousness. Not something intrinsic to us, but you receive what he calls God's gift of righteousness. Talking about human beings there. In Romans 4, 24, he speaks for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. And Romans 4 is particularly using Abraham as an illustration, and it says of Abraham, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now notice that in relation to when the word righteousness is used to people, it is used of it being credited to them or to be being received by them. It is not intrinsically their own. Now it is clearly the righteousness credited to us that is a breastplate that Paul talks about here in Ephesians 6. And I suggest you it involves two things. And we'll talk about both of these things. It involves a new status. That is, a standing before God is declared to be righteous. The word theologians use is it is an imputed righteousness. Now, to impute something is to ascribe something to someone. It does not necessarily belong to them by nature. You ascribe it to them, or it is to reckon on something, or to credit something. There is a righteousness that is imputed, has to do with our standing before God. But secondly, not only is it a new status, it's a new nature as well. That is our living before God. It's not just we're brought into a position of standing before God. We are then to live a life where this righteousness becomes evident and expressed. And we call that an imparted righteousness, a practical righteousness that is given to us. Let's talk about both of these. We'll talk in particular about the first and we'll have less time to talk about the second. First of all then, this righteousness is an imputed righteousness. It's about a new status that we have before God. Now, here is our natural standing before God and it's discouraging, but I'll read it to you in Romans chapter three and verse 10. Where Paul writes there, there is no one righteous. And just in case somebody reading that begins to think, well, generally speaking, yes. But you know, there's one or two. He says there's no one righteous, not even one. We were born that way, and we live that way. Therefore, if we're going to talk about a righteousness that belongs to us, clearly it is something outside of our own abilities and outside of our own nature. Sometimes we may think that we can contribute something to our righteousness. But when we do, Isaiah says of that, in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. In other words, if we think, well, I'm pretty good, I'm okay in this area, I'm deceiving myself because it is at best like filthy rags. Now that raises a big question that Job asked three times in his book. And the question he asked three times was this, can a mortal be righteous before God? That's a big question. And the marvelous answer is, yes. But on what grounds? 
Well, let me read you a key New Testament verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, and it says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the most succinct explanation of the gospel in the New Testament. Christ became all that we are, he was made sin for us, so that we might become all that he is, we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange of the cross of Jesus Christ. He was made sin so that we might be made righteous. Job's question, can a mortal be righteous before God, is like asking the question, can God be a sinner? Now, the instinctive answer to that question is no. But actually, here is the truth. God, in Christ, became a sinner. Because all the sin of the world was imputed to Jesus Christ, God made him to be sin for us. That's a lot different than simply dying for our sin, which he did, but is a much deeper thing than that. He was made to be sin. Christ became a sinner in exactly the same way that you and I become righteous. Not because Christ is himself sinful, or because you and I are ourselves righteous, but he had our sin imputed to him. Jesus Christ on the cross became a liar. He became an adulterer. He became a thief. He became a cheat. He became greedy. He became sin. And if you don't understand or believe that, you won't understand or believe what it means for you to be made righteous. It has nothing to do with how you behave anymore. It had to do with how Jesus behaved. He never behaved as a liar or an adulterer, but he was made one. In order that having our sin imputed to him, his righteousness might be imputed to us. And if we believe one half of that statement, we must believe the other half. And if you doubt whether you are declared to be righteous as one who has placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you doubt the effectiveness of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the object of the gospel is not to get us out of hell into heaven. It is to declare us righteous. In Romans 1 verse 17, Jesus, uh, Paul, rather, writing there, says in the gospel, he sums up the gospel in a sentence here, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. What's your problem? That you're heading to the wrong place? No, your problem is that you're in a wrong position before God. And the work of Jesus Christ is to make right our standing before God that we might be declared righteous. As a consequence, there is a heaven. But that's a consequence, not the purpose. Now, the word righteousness and the word justification are two words closely associated in the writings of Paul. That is, we are declared righteous on the grounds of our justification. Justification is a legal term. It has to do with justice. And it means that justice has been satisfied. For someone to be justified does not mean that they were not guilty. It means that they have satisfied 
justice and the case against them is closed. I have mentioned this when talking about justification before, I think not for a couple of years, for several years. But when capital punishment was still in place in Scotland, and Scottish law is different to English law, and this particularly applies, I understand, to Scottish law, when a person was hanged for their crime, the process was they notice announcing the hanging had taken place was put onto the wall of the prison, outside walls, so that people, journalists and the like could read it and know that the hanging had taken place. And the wording was this, that on such and such a date, at such and such a time, at, let's say, Barlini Prison in Glasgow, so-and-so, naming the criminal, so-and-so was justified. That was the language they used. That didn't mean that the man wasn't guilty. It means that the case closed the moment he died. The issue was finished. The judge now would take off his wig and go home and do something else. The police who had been assigned to the case, their duties were over. The case would and could never be brought up again. Even if they discovered they had hanged somebody in error, they could not try a second man for the same crime because it is over. The penalty has been paid. And the word they used was that he has been justified. You know, sometimes we, we talk about justification, so, well, it's as though we never did it. Well, of course you did it. <laughs> justification means the case is closed. Why? Because the victim has died. Because your sin, my sin, was imputed to Jesus Christ. He became on the cross as dirty as Charles Price is by nature and by behavior. He became sin. So as a result, I might become, in my standing before God, as clean, as beautiful, as righteous as Jesus Christ is. That is the standing of a Christian who on the basis of recognizing their sin has confessed it and thanked the Lord Jesus for dying as their substitute and they've been united to Christ and they've become justified. Now, why does Paul talk about the breastplate of righteousness? Well, as I've already said, what it does is it protects the vital organs, like the bulletproof vest of righteousness, because the way in which Satan will seek to destroy you as a Christian and destroy your effectiveness and your peace as a Christian is he will attack your righteousness and your standing before God. Let me read you a story from the book of Zechariah. If you've got your Bible, turn to it. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah is the second to last book in the Old Testament. So find Matthew, turn left, it's second along. And Zechariah is an interesting book. It has lots of visions, little cameo stories that illustrate what the gospel is really about. And here's one of them. Zechariah chapter 3, and let me read from verse 1, where it says, Then he showed me... Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. This is not Joshua, who is well known to us, the leader of Israel into Canaan. This is another Joshua. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. This, of course, is part of what Satan does. He accuses. He's called in the New Testament the accuser of the brethren. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. 
The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Those filthy clothes represented how he sensed and saw and felt about himself. He was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I'll put rich garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So he put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Here's Satan up to his old tricks of accusing and condemning. And Joshua was accepting the situation. His demeanor, his dress, all indicated his acceptance of that because he knew himself. You know, the devil is a liar, but he doesn't have to lie when he talks about your sin. He can just tell the truth. And you know and I know that it's true. But the Lord says, I have taken away your sin. I'm going to put rich garments on you. And they clothed him. That's a beautiful picture. They clothed him in clean garments that the expression now of Joshua by his clothes and his demeanor was that I'm clean. This is a, a picture used in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adores his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He says, I've been dressed in this robe of righteousness. And you and I need to wear this robe of righteousness to know that we are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus and to wear this bulletproof vest of righteousness because that is where the devil is going to attack you and undermine you and prevent you growing and prevent you being fruitful. Let me read to you part of a letter I received about three weeks ago now from a 19-year-old girl in British Columbia. She said, uh, Dear Charles Price, writing this letter to you has taken a lot of courage and contemplation, for I am by no means a holy person. I'm 19 years old. I don't belong to a church. I've had a sinful past of which I am by no means proud. I've always believed in God being brought to church as a child with my mother and my grandmother. But for many years, I pushed him out of my life. I felt he didn't care about me. It's not until my first year at university my desk partner was a Christian girl, and she names this person. We were left alone one day to work on a project and ended up having a very elaborate conversation about God and Jesus. As I had, at the time, lost all hope that there even was a Christ, I had many questions for her. When I walked into our classroom that day, I had no idea that my life was about to change. I woke up the next morning feeling different, like something in me is missing, something that is now in my grasp. For the first time in many years, I missed Jesus. I even craved him. I thought it was time to contact my mother, as she has been hoping I'd take Jesus back into my life. She also does not belong to any church. However, she never ever misses a single Living Truth episode and insisted when I went to her that I spend the whole day watching Living Truth DVDs. Can you imagine anything worse than that? <laughs> <laughs> I am what you would call a factual person. For the first time in my entire life, I had someone explain the Bible 
in a way that made sense to me. I read the Bible now every night and feel closer to God than I ever have. I beg him for forgiveness and I feel not worthy of his forgiveness. I do not know that God and Jesus will ever forgive me. But I'm searching and praying every night that they will. I live with a 20-year-old man who is my partner. And he's also been searching. And it's been beautiful now that we are sharing the experience of discovering God together. She goes on to say more, but I want to ask this question. I plead, I beg his forgiveness. I'm searching and I'm praying every night that he'll forgive me. But I don't know that God and Jesus will ever forgive me. Who's telling her that? This is the accusation of the devil. You? Forgiven? Look back the last five years, last few years. Look what you've been doing. Look what you're doing. Look at how you're living now. You? Forgiven? Come on. You see, both the Holy Spirit and Satan speak to us about our sin. But they speak with a different voice. When the Holy Spirit speaks about our sin, he convicts us. John 16 verse 8 says, When the Holy Spirit comes here, convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts. When the devil speaks about our sin, he condemns. He is called the accuser of the brethren. The difference is this. Condemnation sits like a wet blanket on you. Conviction makes us aware of our sin, but at the same time, it makes us aware of the way out because he convicts of sin and of righteousness, says Jesus. What does that mean? Well, he'll show you what is wrong, and he'll show you the way out to righteousness. And, you know, the devil speaks to us about our sin as much as the Holy Spirit does, but the result is always condemnation. Under a blanket, we can't get out of it. When the Holy Spirit convicts us and exposes our sin, it's never to condemn us, it's never to humiliate us, it's never to rub our nose in our dirt, it's always to liberate us and cleanse us. Joshua was a stick pulled from the fire. So is this young lady in British Columbia. And the devil is standing by her saying, you dirty, rebellious, sinful person. Who do you think you are? I have no doubt there are probably hundreds of people listening to me this morning in this room. And you hear the voice of the accuser condemning you. Because, you know, the devil is a liar, but he doesn't have to lie when he talks about your sin, because you know it's true. But this is why you and I need the bulletproof vest of righteousness, the, the breastplate of righteousness that says, my heart is protected, my life is protected by the righteousness of Jesus Christ for which I am clothed. You see, if you don't believe that you now stand as pure as Christ, righteous, you do not believe that Jesus Christ hung on the cross as dirty as you. This is the great exchange of the gospel. That doesn't mean she doesn't have to sort some things out. She does. And God the Holy Spirit will lead her and guide her in ways that will sort out all kinds of issues in her life. 
But it begins by knowing, although I don't deserve it any more than Jesus deserved to die for my sin and be made sin for me, he did not deserve that and I do not deserve this, but he took my sin and I take his righteousness. And no matter what the devil whispers in your ear, no matter what you've done last week, if you're in Christ and you have thanked him for dying the death your sin deserves, you are this morning righteous. That's your standing before God. It's our position before him. But it's not just a new status, a new standing, an imputed righteousness. It is also, secondly, a new nature that he imparts to us because when we come into that relationship with God whereby we are declared righteous, he places his Holy Spirit in us to live in us the life of Jesus. And that life in us is intent on producing the character of Christ in us. That's why in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. One of the evidences, it seems to me, one of the most important evidences when a person is genuinely born again of the Holy Spirit is there is a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And if there is not a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, it's probably because there's no life. If there is life, it's because you're sick, spiritually. Because health creates appetite. And the Spirit of God in us is there to restore something of the character of God in us. And we have an appetite for what is real. You see, the evidence that a person is a Christian, not they prayed a prayer two weeks ago or two years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago. You can pray a prayer and not be a Christian. Actually, nobody prayed a prayer to become a Christian in the Bible. You won't find one person who prays to become a Christian. Now, we've reduced it. Say these words after me. Now you're a Christian. No, you deal with God. That's how you become a Christian. You let God get to work in your life. Now that involved praying, of course. But that's not the issue. I hear people talk about that sinner's prayer, whatever that is. No, it's a whole disposition of heart towards God that lives in repentance and faith in him. And he creates in us an appetite and a hunger and a thirst for that which is right. It's the outworking of his presence within us. Let me read you something from the end of that same letter. The end, she says, in the past few months, I've had things happen to me that can only be explained by the grace of God. I have felt different, spoken differently, acted differently. I feel safe from the moment I wake up to the moment I lay down my head. It's a feeling I've never had before. You see, the Christian life is not just a changed position before God, it's a changed living before God. As I mentioned, I'm just back from South America. I met some remarkable people in whose lives God is at work. In Bogota and Colombia, met a lady whose name is Alba. Alba became addicted to alcohol and then to drugs. She turned to prostitution to pay for her drugs. She became homeless, became dirty and unkempt to the extent that nobody wanted her anymore as a prostitute. And she ended up sleeping under a bridge alone not a single friend. One day, two people came by where she was lying down. And as far as I can understand from what she said, they said to her, Jesus loves you. They didn't stay and engage her or get her some food. They just said, Jesus loves you. And her response was, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. 
In other words, it means nothing. But as she lay under that bridge, those words, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, kept coming to her. Nobody loved her. She decided to go and find a church to see if it was true. And she went to a church where they knew and loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And they led her to Christ. She immediately began to try and reach some of the girls who had been in the situation she had been in. There was an old man in the church who was dying. And he had a piece of property, a building in Bogota. And before he died, he changed his will to leave that property to her as a place where she could reach out to some of these girls and women that she began to work with. I spent a morning with them. The place is called New Life for Women. I have a couple of pictures. I'm sorry I'm in that one. I don't have one of just Alba on her own. In January, she had seven girls who were living there, coming off the streets, coming to know Christ. When I was there 12 days ago, they had 40 girls and women, most of them under 20. The youngest that I spoke to was 14 years of age. They actually used Living Truth DVDs to teach them in Spanish. And um, so they asked me if I'd come and spend a morning with them and uh, speak to them from the Word of God, which I did. It's a tremendous privilege. And we had half an hour, 45 minutes of worship before that. And it was incredibly moving, and I can't convey it to you. So look at the faces that were so alive and so joyful. In most of them, there are one or two whose faces were not. And I said to Alba, there's a girl over here. She looked as though she wasn't quite connected. No, no, she's only been here for three days. And there was a girl over on my left. Yeah, she only came in yesterday. No, they haven't come to know Christ yet. A transformation that you can't explain in human terms. Here's a picture of some of the girls who wanted a picture with me. <laughs> I mean, they look so young. They are so young. But Jesus Christ has got a hold of their lives. They're not only declared righteous because all of their sin, and they all come from backgrounds that make it impossible for them to walk a straight line in life. And they've gone for the easy money, even though all the abuse that's gone with that, all of that has been placed on Christ and all his righteousness has been placed on them. And his spirit in them gives them an appetite and a joy and a life that's impossible apart from that. I'm tired of Christians who tell me they became a Christian 20 years ago and that's about it whose lives don't radiate the presence of Christ, who are not life-giving in their dealings with other people, which is how the Spirit of God is going to be when he's at work within us. Because it's not just a standing, it's a life. It's not just an imputed righteousness. It's an imparted, life-giving, day-by-day righteousness where out of our hearts there flows a river. Jesus said that. You know, it's broken people who are much more ready to recognize this than those of us who try so hard to be self-contained and self-respectable, which is the, one of the flaws of our culture. It's why people spend so much money on makeup, I'm talking about men as well as women, to disguise who we really are, to portray a nice attractiveness that we think will kid people. No, it's people who are real about who they are, and real about their weaknesses, and real about their sin, and real about what it is to be human, who find the exchange so much better. 
You know, Jesus told a story one day. It's in Luke 18. I'll read it to you. Verse 9. He said, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Let me pause there a moment. Are you ever tempted to think like that? It's tempting, isn't it? God, I thank you I'm not like that or this person. If you think like that, you are arrogant with an arrogance of the worst kind. It's an arrogance of self-righteousness. Because the moment we think in those terms, we're self-righteous. It's good and important to thank God for his salvation, for the liberation he's brought to us, the forgiveness he's brought to us. But to say, God, I thank you. I'm not like that guy down there or that girl over there is self-righteous arrogance. And Jesus went on, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, that this man, rather than the other man, went home justified before God. You know, God works best in those who know their weakness. That's why sometimes he mercilessly exposes it to us. That's why he has to break us sometimes. Those who don't know their weakness or who kid themselves about the true condition of their hearts live on the sidelines of fruitfulness. Because righteousness flows out of the acknowledged unrighteousness that leaves room only for Jesus Christ to live his life in us and through us. You know, in Matthew 21, verse 31, Jesus was talking to the priests and elders in Jerusalem. He said to them this, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. What was the way of righteousness John the Baptist showed them? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And of those who said, I'm a sinner, I'm in desperate need of this. And out of their brokenness, he says, it's the tax collectors who were in a category of sinners that was mentioned many times in the Gospels because they were cheats, they worked for the Romans, they deceived the Jews, etc. They stole from them. He says, tax collectors and prostitutes are at the front. I read that verse to these girls, actually. I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the pot that was marred in the hands of the potter in Jeremiah 18, and the potter reworked it into something good. And I talked about being broken marred pots and what that means. Our lives are messed up. What does the potter do? Throw us away? Put us on the garbage? No. Put us on the back shelf? Maybe somebody somewhere sometime will find something. No, he remolds in something good. I said, what's going on in your life? Is that God, the potter, is remolding you into something good. And he's remolding me into something good. If we let him. And it's the prostitutes, the tasters who are most likely to let him, the self-respecting, Christianized Western people are the least likely to let him. We just, we're okay. We think. Let me introduce you to another guy I met also in Bogota. His name's Eduardo. And he was the leader of a soccer gang. Soccer is very big in South America. 
And one of the biggest teams that uses the biggest stadium, in fact, this picture we took outside the stadium, and 70,000 to a game, he had a gang supporting their team and they had to become members of this gang. There were 10,000 members of this gang. Eduardo was the leader. He had the name of a soccer team branded across his back with hot irons that you brand cattle with without any anesthetic and the initials, three initials of the team branded down his right side. He took off his shirt and showed me them. He said to the gang, if any of you are willing to brand, get, have yourself branded, you can become the leader of the gang. <laughs> Nobody else did. He would lead the kind of chants and supports and things during the games. They would riot after the games, notorious for the rioting that took place. They would party, he said, for two days after every game with a lot of girls. He got a girlfriend and she became pregnant. She was underage. And he thought, well, I need to stick with her through until this baby is born. And one day, this girl said to him, I'm in love with another man. And his first response was say, phew, that's great, off you go. Pass you on. But he feigned to be angry because it was like an insult to him. He said, what's his name? She said, Jesus Christ. And together, he also came to Christ. He's now married to her. They have a second little baby now, a tiny baby. He was beautifully gentle in the way he held this baby. He has a job, but his mission in life now is to take the gospel to all those gang members. And his ambition, he told me, is to preach in the stadiums that they used to go and wreck havoc in, in the soccer games. If you met this guy, you'd think he's the most gentle, beautiful, kind, warm, loving guy. And he is, because in him, is the life of Jesus portraying the righteousness of Jesus. But if you knew him, I think it was three years ago, you would have seen a wild, arrogant, evil, we probably would have said, vindictive. He was a fighter. And they had weapons for their fighting. God got hold of him. And all the sin of Eduardo, all the attacks he made on other people, all the girls that he'd slept with during that time and parted with, all of that sin was laid on Jesus Christ. And all of the righteousness and beauty and gentleness of Jesus Christ was laid on Eduardo. And having been imputed with God's righteousness, the Spirit of God has imparted his righteousness. And his life is spent bringing other people to Christ. You know, Paul talks in Philippians 1 and verse 11 about being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. What is the fruit of righteousness? Well, Isaiah 32, verse 17 says, the fruit of righteousness will be peace, the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. I only found this verse this week when I was preparing this message for this morning. And I thought the fruit of righteousness will be peace. When I walked into that uh, New Life for Women center in Bogota, 
in a dirty part of the city, unkempt, poor part of the city, there was a peace. When I sat and talked with Eduardo, there's a peace. Why? It's the fruit of righteousness. It's the genuine working of God in his life. Went out into the jungle area of Colombia, where there's been a lot of fighting and kidnapping. You've got the Marxist guerrillas, you've got the drug barons who have their private armies. And I met with a man there, an, a missionary, who was captured and held hostage for five months, tied to a tree with a rope around his neck the whole time and a place where he could lie down and sleep, a hammock. It took 26 men to protect him, to guard him from any attempt to release him. There was always a barrel of a gun a few inches from his head. Loaded guns. When he slept, they probably relaxed a bit, but the moment he stood in his hammock, the gun would come up again to his head. After five months, he was exchanged for a ransom. Not the ransom that originally asked for, it was much, much less, but they negotiated a release. He got to know those men during those five months. They were only there to protect him, or to, to protect him from being released. And God gave him a heart for them. And so he now spends his whole ministry going into those jungle areas to reach these guerrillas and fighters. And a number have come to know Christ. They drop little radios with parachutes into the jungle, switched on, fixed tune, solar powered, so they go for years, fixed tune to a Christian station which he runs. And many through that have heard the gospel and come to Christ. In fact, one of the transmitters is one that we at People's Church built for them several years ago. Went out to where he lives and where a number of these men now are living and working. And uh, we'd go out and, and just talk to somebody. I remember talking, the first guy we talked to was just a very innocent looking guy in his mid-twenties. After we'd greeted, said hello, a few things. We moved on, he said, that guy killed four people in one shootout. There were six against him and a couple others. He killed four of them. And he's killed others too. Another guy who was leading a, a bull, because they raised cattle there. And um, we talked to him, he was a nice guy. And after he said, I don't know how many people he's murdered, but he's killed a lot. But something radiating in their faces, you knew straight away they were Christians. You see, this breastplate of righteousness, this bulletproof vest of righteousness, is that we have a standing before God on the grounds of the cross of Christ where we are declared as righteous as Jesus Christ is. That's our position, that's our standing, but the Spirit of God in us is imparting to us not only this hunger for righteousness, but this growth in righteousness and the fruit of righteousness, which is peace, and quietness and contentment. Says Isaiah. And you know, I always come back from places like that saying, how do we break through the superficiality that is so easily a part of our Christianity in the West? How do we break through that? Well, you know, sometimes God has to break us. God has to sometimes put us in situations where he cripples us and we don't know what else to do except start to become honest and genuine and real before God. And then he does his work. Now, I don't know how God has spoken to you this morning, but there may well be people here and there will be people here. You've never come into that relationship whereby you are declared righteous before God. Nothing to do with how you are yourself that you've received the righteousness of Christ clothed in his righteousness because Christ was clothed in your sin. 
And this morning you can simply say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for dying for me in that way. Thank you for taking my sin upon yourself, being made sin. I thank you for that. I confess my sin to you. Would you forgive me and clothe me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? And then by your Holy Spirit, and there may be others of us, you've come into that position, but you're still living by your own wits and still living by your own resources, still operating in human strengths. Say, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, fill me with the life of Jesus that he in me and through me will express his character, his goodness, his kindness, his love. That there'll be a river of life that flows out of my heart. It has nothing to do with what I do any more than being right to what I do. It's what God does in us and through us. Now, if we can help you in that as we close the service in just a moment, do come down to the front. There'll be folks here to talk with you, help you, pray with you. You might be sure that you are growing in this wonderful relationship with Christ makes life what it was always intended to be. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so much this morning that on the cross you were made all that we are, that we might be made all that you are in our standing before you. We stand on holy ground, declared righteous. Thank you for that. We don't deserve it. But thank you too for the Holy Spirit who creates within us that appetite to grow in godliness and righteousness and fruitfulness. Out of our hearts there flows a river of life that awakens other people's hearts and brings them life too. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll give us a hunger for this and a compassion for people that flows out of your work in our hearts. Make it real and experiential for every one of us in this building, I pray. Amen. Amen.